Last July I went camping with some friends, Sam, Evan, and Elizabeth. I'd seen Sam and Evan recently, but Elizabeth was coming too, and I hadn't seen her since she moved to Alaska. I was excited to see everybody and just hang out by the tent, drink some beer, and cook some good food on the fire. Sure enough, as soon as we got there, we set up the tent, cracked open the beer, and started playing drinking games. First we played King's Cup, and then Never Have I Ever, you know, the basics. As it got darker, we turned on an old lantern that Evan had brought. We only really had the light of the lantern, the stars, the fire, and the full moon, and occasionally our phones lighting us up as we laughed and drank and hung out. Then, as the moon began to rise, we started hearing a faint howling noise off in the distance. We couldn't make out what it was. While I'll admit I was definitely a bit scared, being a city boy who's never seen a wolf in person, I was intrigued enough, or maybe I should say tipsy enough, to want to investigate. I was trying to hide my excitement at hearing real nature howls. I thought it would be funny to howl back, but my friend stopped me. Living in Alaska these past few months, Elizabeth was much more in tune with the dangers of wildlife in a way I didn't know as a city boy. My only interactions with nature were through things like National Geographic. Maybe because they were intrigued also, or maybe just to mess with Elizabeth, Sam and Evan joined in on the howling too, and soon I followed suit. Eventually we began getting sleepy and ran out of ideas for drinking games, so we decided to crash. Sam and Evan were staying in one tent, and Elizabeth and I were staying in another. Nothing was happening between us, it's just the way the sleeping arrangement worked out. I gave her privacy while she changed and I felt the urge to go and use the bathroom. I was going to use the public bathroom in the middle of the campground, the kind with spiderwebs the size of your head in every corner and dirt all over the sink, which makes you wonder if you're even dirtier after washing your hands. It was for that very reason, as well as the beautiful night, that I decided instead to go over by the river. The moonlight reminded me of a painting, and I chuckled to myself, imagining Bob Ross painting happy little trees along the mountain. I unzipped, went about my business, and enjoyed the fresh cool evening air on my face, cooling me down from the flush of alcohol. I was about to finish up, when I saw movement on the other side of the river. I squinted my eyes to see a little more clearly, thinking it was probably a deer or something and hoping it was a moose, since I've always wanted to see one but never had the chance. Well, whatever it was, it was definitely big enough to be a moose. As the figure came close to the bank of the river, I noticed it definitely wasn't a moose. For a second I thought it was a doe or a big dog, until I realized it was neither of those. It was a giant wolf, and when I say giant, I mean absolutely monstrous. I was definitely freaking out a little bit, but I think I had enough alcohol in me that the fear was muted and the curiosity was heightened. I stepped closer to the river, trying to get an even better look at the thing. It was occasionally glancing over at me but was mainly just standing there. I took one more step closer, and boom! I slipped on a mossy rock, landing right on my butt. I got up and saw that this wolf was now staring right at me. I'm not sure if I scared it or if it was just curious. But then that's when it happened. The wolf, what I thought was a giant grey wolf, then stood up on its hind legs. My first thought was that maybe it was doing what my cat does when she wants a treat or she's curious which is to stand up on her hind legs to get a better look. But upon regaining my composure and looking closely, I realized it wasn't just balancing itself on its hind paws. It wasn't just propped up to get a better view. It didn't have paws. It had feet. Feet with large claws coming out of them. And it didn't have front paws either, but what appeared to be raccoon-like human hands with claws. It had the face of a giant wolf and was now snarling at me. That's when the scariest thing ever happened in my life. This creature, which after extensive googling once I got home I'm sure was a dogman, took a step towards me bipedally, on two legs like a man, and then another, and another, and another. Deliberate well-balanced steps, like it was used to walking on two legs normally. Steps that any animal should not be used to. I was terrified, frozen with fear. Every nerve in my body was on fire screaming at me to get out of there. Every step this thing took sent me deeper and deeper into this fear-driven paralysis. My heart was now beating so hard it was like thunder, and I was sweating bullets. I was sure this thing was going to do god knows what. Eat me, maul me, tear me to pieces. Then, luckily, it looked up, kind of looked around, and then looked off to the left as if it knew something, looked back at me, and disappeared back into the tree line. For a moment, I stayed there, nearly hyperventilating 
just trying to breathe deeply to stop my heart from collapsing in on itself. After a few minutes I got the shakes, but luckily I was able to regain movement. I slowly backed away from the river, got into my tent where my friend Elizabeth was out cold. Surprisingly, I somehow managed to sleep. It was a pretty restless sleep of course, and I was in such shock that I forgot to change my pants. The next day, I told my friends what I saw, but they all just laughed at me and told me, yeah dude, you were too drunk, you need to lay down. But I know what I saw. I haven't been hiking since because if creatures like that live out in the mountains, I'd rather stay away. But I've been reading up on dogmen, and everything people talk about rings true with my own experience. I never believed in so-called cryptids before, but ever since I went camping with my friends that day, I'm now a believer. I always loved Januaries ever since I was a small child. It was one of the only times I ever got to spend with my father, who was away from home most of the year. He worked in oil drilling operations in Alaska's North Slope, which meant that I only got to see him for very short intervals throughout the year except for his yearly time off from mid-December all the way through February. I was extremely close with my father, and despite being a girl, we both shared a passion and love for the outdoors, especially fishing. In fact, most of his time off was spent in search of the ultimate fishing spot. He always looked for one that had an equal balance of sights to see and fish to catch. During his break in 2009, he found a great fishing spot in Alaska, which he claimed was as vast, if not bigger, than the town we were from. He said that the river split into various channels over an area of land that stretched out for hundreds of miles. My mind was racing just thinking about all the different species of fish that such a large stretch of river would possess. I felt that all of our previous outings and fishing trips would pale in comparison to this one, for more reasons than just the fishing. It was also the first time that we would be going to Alaska for one of our fishing trips. This trip, to the Kobuk River, gave us the perfect chance to learn about a new wilderness spot. Even the drive to Alaska was scattered with awe-inspiring scenery. My father took the most scenic routes he could find. My mind wandered as I watched the majestic foothills and beautiful landscapes out the window. We left our house with enough provisions for a whole week, and brought along our trusted kayak to enhance the fishing experience. It's always good to be familiar with your boat to have the best experience. We planned to follow the route taken by some of the Kobuk's earlier settlers. The brochures we had promised a lot of fishing camps and hunting spots along the way. There was even the chance of finding an object of archaeological importance as we passed through the lesser used paths. The area was very difficult to reach at first, and I'm sure my father must have wished that we had come with a larger fishing party than just me. I was still young and really too small to be of any real assistance. We were saved when, along the way, we made it to the village of Ambler, where my father was able to leave behind our small kayak and rent a good-sized raft that we would use from that point onwards. A guide had warned us to be wary of the rapids, and even gave us a map so we would know when we were approaching them. He also gave us a very stern warning to look out for bears entering our campsite at night. Even though they were the target of hunts and usually avoided humans, you could never be sure. I also got the feeling he wanted to warn us to be on the lookout for something else, but held himself back at the last minute. Little did I know then that we would soon get a good idea of what he was thinking of. We saw many sights along the way, and came across several other hunting parties on the shore setting up their camps. Light aircraft could be seen flying overhead, bringing people into the rivers and we saw other rafting groups with people fishing. We arrived at Ambler on Friday, and had spent a whole three days afloat along the many sub-rivers and tributaries of the Kobuk River, when we spotted an area of open land with no hunting parties or fishing companies on it. It was now midday, around 3 p.m. It looked to be the perfect place to start a small fire and cook ourselves some lunch. The journey to this spot had been a tumultuous one with currents that had taken us a good distance from the shore. Just as my father rode the raft towards the shore to land it, a large caribou came running at great speed from out of the dense forest, just a couple of feet from the shore. It stopped, paused at the foot of the river just in front of us, but as the trees rattled behind it, it quickly plunged into the ice-cold waters and started swimming straight towards our raft. We both looked at each other, thinking that we were witnessing something incredible, and wondering what else was about to happen or come out of the forest. We were both curious to see what predator or hunter was chasing it and making it so scared. As it started to swim towards us, my father whispered that he was worried it could either be a bear or maybe a hunter indiscriminately firing in our direction, who might be off in the trees, but neither showed up to the shore. Instead, to our horror, 
a massive wolf-like creature on two legs reared its grotesque face from the thick forest as it entered the open land. It briefly stopped to search its surroundings and quickly spotted the caribou in the water. It made a blood-curdling howl that sounded like no animal I had ever heard before, almost having a human-like quality to it. The caribou's eyes were wide with fear, and we worried about where it might be heading since it continued to head deeper into the water. The wolf creature quickly ran towards the shore, only pausing as the water brushed up against its strangely shaped legs. Howling as if in frustration that it could not reach the caribou, it showed its long teeth, eager to bite into its prey. The wolf creature quickly ran towards the shore, only pausing as the water brushed up against it. We pushed ourselves deeper into the body of the river, hoping to catch a current to take us out of the area. I threw a quick glance over at the caribou, and it seemed to be thinking the same thing. The wolf creature was now starting to go into the water as well, and with a bit of quick thinking, I threw some of the fish we'd caught in its direction, hoping to catch its attention and maybe distract it. Luckily, this seemed to work. We were finally able to catch a current, and as we drifted away from this wolf-man hybrid creature, it stopped its chase when one of the fish swam near it. We stayed drifting in our raft for hours until we came upon a large hunting party on the shore. We must have looked like a wreck as they happily invited us among them. We were visibly shaken from the whole ordeal and explained what had happened. One member told us we had just encountered the legendary Dogman of Alaska, a dog-human hybrid that is supposedly said to roam the areas of this river, the areas most men don't dare go. He claimed it was good fortune to see it, but knowing how close we came to being face to face with this creature with its predatory calculating look, we felt anything but lucky. Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think of these encounters. I've been a farmer for almost a decade now. I inherited a small patch of land from my parents, about an hour to an hour and a half drive from St. Louis, Missouri. I hail from one of the first families to settle down in the entirety of the Missouri area, and the land that I decided to call home and establish my roots here has been in our family for generations. It's a scenic outcrop of evergreen pastures that go on for miles in every direction. There's a rather large river on one end, not too far from the farmhouse, that provides water to my crops and livestock. East of my property is a deep forest that forms part of the Mark Twain National Forest. This forest, along with the occasional pest outbreaks and the drop in the price of livestock, has been my biggest headache on the farm. Although the forest wasn't an official border to my farm because technically I owned a large part of it, I soon came to learn that it was best if I treated it as an official border for the east end of my property and never pass that border. I'll get into that here shortly, and you'll understand why. My farm is based in a pretty remote area, far from any human activity. That was one of its biggest selling points to me, and one of the reasons why nobody else in the family had wanted it. In a way, I think my parents knew I'd appreciate the solitude and off-the-grid lifestyle it would provide me, which is why they chose to leave it to me in the first place. You have to drive through a maze of dirt roads just to make it to the nearest town, and I honestly liked it that way. But four years into owning the land, I began to lose the occasional sheep to various wildlife that would venture out of the forest in search of food. This almost always happened at night when I was fast asleep. I never did witness what would kill my sheep directly, but I'd find tracks at the site of the kill that gave me a rather good idea of what it was. With the tracks always being canine-like, I knew the local woods harbored some wolf packs. We even had a bear show up on the property at one point. Although it didn't cause any harm to the livestock, it seemed to be interested in looking around. I had seen it coming from a distance and was safely watching it from my kitchen window, but it finally got bored and left some two hours later. Since livestock farming was one of the main ways I made an income, the predators that ventured out of the forest onto my farm prompted me to build a secure enclosure for my sheep. I also got a sheepdog to keep them safe when they were out grazing. After constructing a proper enclosure for my sheep and getting a sheepdog to keep an eye on them, the casualties all but stopped. Not that the occasional forest animal didn't come wandering in every now and then though. Now, I know I just said that the casualties stopped, but let me just say that was only until April of 2012. This was around the time my sheepdog named Jack began to get really worked up come dawn. Every day I would bring him inside with me after we had directed the sheep back into the enclosure around 5 p.m. daily. But for some strange reason he'd go crazy barking frantically towards the direction of the sheep's enclosure at nighttime. Having worked with animals even before I ever moved to the farm, I knew that my dog's panic was nothing to take lightly. One Thursday, he was so frantic that he even began hurling himself against the door. 
Also, the sheep were bleeding so loudly I could hear them from inside the house. All of this prompted me to go and investigate what was really happening. It was around 10 p.m., and I reached for my shotgun, heading towards the sheep's enclosure. Jack ran ahead of me and seemed to stop at a distance, growing ever more frantic. Little did I know we were both about to encounter the most terrifying night of our lives. As I caught up to Jack and came closer, a seven-foot silhouette greeted me. What I saw was so ghastly and shocking that I froze in my tracks. Jack wasn't doing any better and kept a safe distance from the creature, barking at it like I'd never heard him bark before. The creature's shape resembled something you'd expect to see in a Bram Stoker novel. Had I not been so close to it, I probably would have thought it was a very large bear. It had a face no different from one of the timber wolves that came to the farm. But that was about as far as the similarities went. Its body, especially its torso, resembled that of a man. It had long human-like arms that almost went as far down to its ankles, with hominid-like hands that ended in extremely large claws. Its face stared at us in a grimace, and I couldn't tell if it was about to lunge at us or if it was making sure we did not come any closer. Just for the record, I had no intention of doing that. Its lower body was more wolf-like, but what stood out the most was its bipedal gait and the way it stood. It never deviated, not even once during our encounter, which made me realize that it must always use two legs and not four. I couldn't look away from it as it faced off with my dog, who was going absolutely berserk. The creature responded by making a blood-curdling sound that sounded more like a man moaning, crying, or screaming. It's hard to say which, more human than any sound that a canine would ever produce. It stood there in a territorial standoff with my dog, neither one moving an inch, until eventually Jack mustered up enough courage to advance toward it, calling its bluff and sending the creature bolting towards the woods. I couldn't believe he did that. Soon after this creature ran off, I grabbed my phone and called 911. Jack and I stood frozen in place and didn't even think to withdraw ourselves back to the house. We literally couldn't think. I waited for the cops from the nearest town to arrive. Ah, the pain of living rural. They came about an hour after the incident, so around 11 p.m., and they confirmed the encounter did happen, but they could not confirm what species of animal did it. They were able to confirm because they found a dead animal just outside the enclosure, and around it was a strange set of tracks. The tracks headed off into the woods exactly where we watched it run. I heard one officer whispering to another that these tracks looked strange since they were too big to be a wolf, and I also heard him say that it appeared that this creature walked off on two legs instead of four. I didn't sleep that night, and I haven't slept well since. Every time my dog barks in the early dawn hours, I think of this horrific encounter. It's definitely a trigger that brings me right back to that day. Unfortunately, it happens way more than I'd like it to, and I'm hoping that one day, I'll get past it all. But for now, I'm just doing the best I can. It's been a few Novembers since this happened, but it's still terrifying all the same. Even typing it out brings back really bad memories, but I feel it's an important story to share and really disproves the notion that monsters don't exist. Because what my friend and I saw that night is something straight out of a Stephen King novel. You have to understand that right before this happened, a very close family friend, who I've been friends with for a long time and still am, had her boyfriend of six years cheat on her and then dump her. Not only was she emotionally distraught, but she was really needing company and did not want to be alone. Since I was free for the weekend and didn't have any plans, I offered to come stay at her place for the weekend. It would keep her mind occupied and lift her spirits. I showed up and we had a little bit of a girl's night, watching movies, eating popcorn, just doing anything we could to keep her mind off her ex-boyfriend. Because of her not having the greatest finances in the world, she ended up with this little podunk place kind of on the outskirts of town. A lot of woods around, but still very pretty on the outside. It wasn't like it was run down or anything, just very small. But it was just her living there, where her ex could and would occasionally visit her when they were together. So, what else more could you need? At about 11 or maybe midnight, my phone was down to about 9 or 10% battery, and I realized, oh crap, I left my charger and clothes in the car. So I headed out to my car to retrieve all my stuff since I was staying the weekend, and that's right when I saw what looked to be or appeared to be a werewolf. I stepped out on her front porch, clicked the unlock button, and as soon as I was doing this, the front porch light and my car lights came on together, 
illuminating the entire area. Right before, as I clicked the button before opening the door, it was pitch black. As soon as both lights came on, I was screaming, totally startled by what I saw standing maybe not even six feet behind my car, approaching the house. It was this really tall, I hate to say it, cliche werewolf figure. Instantly, I felt like I was in slow motion, like my brain was scrambling to try and just make sense of what I was taking in visually. I was seeing it right in front of me, the most realistic werewolf costume I had ever seen in my life. But as it was moving, I could clearly see its defined muscles working under its skin and the way it was breathing coming towards me. This was something straight out of a movie or a Stephen King novel. I would know. I've read a lot of his books growing up. I love him as an author, which is why the first thing I thought of when I saw this, believe it or not, was his book Silver Bullet, which is all about werewolves. I was now screaming, turned around, went back in the house, locking the door. Now, as I'm coming back in the house, fumbling with my keys trying to lock the door, my friend, who's curious but also now panicked, rushes to the window to see what's wrong. Then she began screaming as she starts asking me, what is that thing? She now sees it too. That's when she closes the blinds, and we both run and dive into the kitchen, grab the largest knife she had, and sat there huddled together, crying. Within a minute, we hear this thing walk like a man would on two legs to the very back door where her sliding glass door is. Luckily, that had blinds on it too. It was very aggressively trying to open the door, as if this animal knew what handles were. So that means this was either a person in a very convincing costume, or this was something else entirely. We were dealing with a real-life monster here. It was rattling the door so violently and so hard that maybe after 10 or 15 seconds, it gave up. It paced around the house a couple more times, pounding on the windows, scratching on the house. Not heavily though, but I believe if it wanted to, this thing possessed the strength to shatter a window, but it was like it was trying to find a weak point into the house, like it was strategizing and thinking, trying to get in. At one point, it kept wiggling the door handle of the front door violently as if hoping it would release. Luckily, it never did. We went through a period of time where we did not hear it at all, but still far too worried to get up from the kitchen floor, so we decided to stay put, still crying, still scared. The only sound being the outside and the TV faintly going. About 12 minutes now went by, and I do remember this because I was looking right at the clock on the oven, which was right next to where we were on the floor, perfectly visible. We heard a couple very loud distinctive pops. It sounded like something being blown up, or a large balloon popping, two of them actually, and then silence. We heard nothing. Eventually, my friend and I just fell asleep huddled next to each other, knives still in our hands. I was the first to wake up. I jolted my friend awake, telling her we made it, it's morning, the light's out. It was now maybe about 7.45, maybe 8 a.m. at this point, and it's almost winter, so the sun is kind of late on rising, especially here up north. My phone was now dead, and because I had an Android and she had an iPhone, I had no choice but to go and grab my charger from the car. I was going to figure something out, that, and just thinking I cannot let my friend stay here. She didn't have a car at the time, and she mainly got rides back and forth. As I went out to my car, I realized something horrifying. Even though the sun was up and I was now no longer afraid to go into the darkness, the two back tires of my Prius were completely flat. I walked over to check them out. It looked as if somebody had slashed them, but upon looking closer, I realized that something large had actually bit into them, popping them with its teeth. There were these huge puncture holes in both the back tires. I mean, these tires were not just a little flat, they were completely flat, and I had already used my spare and never bothered to replace it about a year or two ago before this. To make a long story short, I ended up calling a tow truck. I had the guy give me his personal opinion on what he thought happened. He told me, Sweetheart, you either have a very aggressive bear that bit these tires or you ran over some spikes, but something happened here. Anyway, I took my friend with me back to my place, where she would stay for two more weeks before returning back to her house, only for a couple of days before going to stay with her family for a couple of months, then permanently moving there. 
She eventually went back to town, but only for a day to collect her belongings, never staying overnight. Whatever happened that night, we don't talk about it. I wish I knew more about what it is that we saw, this woolly, hairy, shaggy, wolf-looking thing. But unfortunately, I'm not a biologist. Thank you for taking the time to read this encounter. I hope if anything it's provided at least some entertainment, even if it's been at my expense, and even if it has been at my friend's expense as well. Thank you. It was late March 2007 when I saw it. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you, but I've got to share it with somebody, anybody. I figured maybe if more people knew about it, well, maybe someday there might be some real answers. That's got to count for something. It might one day even save some lives. Who knows? Maybe they'll collect each other's encounters. Anyway, here it goes. I was just a kid when this happened. We were in the middle of soccer practice. It was a late sunny afternoon but nothing too blinding. This was back when I was still dreaming of going to Berkeley. One of my teammates kicked the ball really hard, and I started forward, but the ball sailed straight over my head, out of the soccer park, and across the street into a cluster of tightly woven trees. It was weird that it would land there because most of the land around the park was grassy and open, but I dismissed it and glanced from side to side in case of any incoming traffic. The streets surrounding the park were usually over busy, but I watched as one car, a common navy blue sedan, passed by me. Everybody was impatient for me to get the ball, but I shrugged it off and crossed the street. I could see the mountains to my right, and as I jogged across the hot pavement, that's when I saw it. My teammates were much too far away to see anything. Right behind the ball something was moving, something big. I honestly thought it was a stray dog at first. I mean, anybody would if they'd seen it too. The dark, fluffy head of rust-colored fur could easily belong to a Malamute or even a long-haired German Shepherd. It could have even been a cross of the two, I suppose. I watched as the canine's nose wrinkled up and down, taking in the scent of the soccer ball. I watched in fascination and terror as it continued to lean closer. Since I liked dogs, I stupidly called over to it, thinking it was maybe friendly. The thing, and I say thing because I realized shortly it was not a dog, glanced up at me and began to stand on its hind legs. I remember the impossibly long shadow as it fell over me. This thing, or dog, or whatever you want to call it, must have easily been twice my size. Whatever its true height was, I was scared, and I'm not exactly the type that scares easily. Yet in that moment, I could feel the blood drain from my skin as this dreaded creature stared me down with its soul-piercing gaze. The yellow eyes were like burning embers, something almost human staring straight through me, like it was judging whether to let me go. I couldn't pry myself away. Its gaze was absolutely mesmerizing. There was a dangerous sort of intelligence reflecting back from deep within its eyes, something far older and much more mysterious than its furry predecessors. I stayed where I was for what seemed like a long time. There really wasn't anywhere else I could go, to be honest. I wasn't sure how fast this thing could run, but I was willing to bet it was a lot faster than me. And I was in good shape, but with legs like that, there was no way I would even stand a chance. Its stride had to have been more than likely two or three times wider than mine. I could imagine it closing the gap between us in a mere heartbeat. The creature let out a low, guttural growl. It rumbled out in a curious warning but didn't sound anything like a dog should have sounded. It was almost like there were two different vocal cords. Whatever it was, it definitely did not hiss like me. That was fine with me. I didn't like it much either. Even if it was a him, I couldn't tell because there was a shadow between us. I bravely reached out with my trembling arm and grabbed the ball. Using one of its massive clawed paws, with nails that could have easily rivaled those of Confucius in length if Confucius had ever been a dog-like beast, the creature suddenly swung back into the woods. I quickly grabbed the ball and made a dash for it. As I moved, this thing was making a trembling noise in the woods, smashing around the trees and emitting a low growl. To my great surprise, it seemed to disappear very shortly. I was terrified beyond my wits, and I scanned the horizon for any sign of life. But there was none. My teammates back over were shouting loudly, yet I paid no attention to them. I was astonished at what I'd seen. Eventually I gave up hope that I might one day see this thing again. Whatever it was, it was long gone. I hurried and took the soccer ball back to my teammates, where I then shared my story with them. They all thought I was nuts. I kinda thought I had lost it there too for a moment. And I never did see that thing again. 
though I went back many times to the same field. Maybe it was just passing through. Anyway, after that, I believe anything's possible. Though I think the real question is, what do you think? What animal did I see? In April 2004, I was driving southbound on Highway 321 around 9 p.m., just north of Chugwater, Texas. As I drove down the road, the largest German Shepherd I'd ever seen stepped out onto the road, on two legs. Startled, I slammed on my brakes, and the creature lifted its left arm to shield its eyes from my oncoming headlights. I came to a stop about 10 feet away from it, and it just stood there, holding its arm over its face. I was freaking out, not knowing what the hell I was looking at. Then, the creature slowly lowered its arm, and I saw its piercing amber eyes. I had my windows rolled down, and I could have sworn I heard it snarl at me. This thing was incredibly intimidating, standing at least nine feet tall. It was very lanky and skinny, with shaggy long hair hanging off its arms. I couldn't get a good look at its legs. I went into fight or flight mode, threw my car into drive, and swerved around the creature, pressing the acceleration all the way down. The experience was surreal, like everything slowed down in that one minute. I didn't bother looking in my rearview mirror to see if it was going to follow me. A fear took over me so intense that I felt if I didn't drive off, I would have been done for. 